many people mistakenly presume that this is an issue of free speech. That what is at stake is the freedom of speech and the right to say what, whatever you want to say. But I want to state quite clearly that this is not the case. The issue of insulting the Prophet ﷺ really has absolutely nothing to do with the freedom of speech, even from a Western perspective. And this is because every single society in the world, every single society has certain issues that it considers taboo. It considers unmentionable. Sometimes that taboo is legally enshrined, that the government says, you cannot talk about that. And every single country on the face of this earth has laws directed against certain types of speech, libel, slander, hate speech, etc. Sometimes it is not the government that sets these laws. It is societal norms and cultural values. Every single society has certain issues that are simply taboo. You don't talk about them. Or if you do, you must pay a price. Maybe not going to jail, but you will pay a social stigma. You will pay a price of your value being lost in society. Again, it's not that it's illegal. It's that every society, every culture has, as I said, a line that you don't cross. Now, it just so happens that the honor of our Prophet wasallam doesn't exist beyond that line for them. They have other issues that is beyond that line. But the honor of our Prophet ﷺ, the sanctity of our religion, the holiness of what we deem to be sacred, is not beyond that. We are not asking for such things to be made illegal. I understand that in this country it's not going to be possible. But what we are asking is that they become culturally taboo. Self-imposed, we call it. Self-imposed silencing, not legal silencing. And I want to give you another example. And this happened, ironically, after the Danish cartoon controversy by a few months. David Irving, how many of you have heard of David Irving? Not too many. This is a name we need to know as Muslims not to support. I don't support this person at all. But to demonstrate the double standards that exist in the society and culture that we live in. David Irving is a famous, or I should say infamous, historian. He used to teach at Oxford, he has a long resume. And he became infamous because he wrote many books talking about the Holocaust and saying that this figure of six million is too many. It wasn't six, it was lesser than that. He wasn't denying the Holocaust. What he was doing was questioning the history of the Holocaust. Now I stand here today and I say unequivocally, I do not support David Irving. And I am not a Holocaust denier. I am not. But what I find amazing was that nobody, not one single person, stood up and said, you know what, he's a historian, he should have the right to write his books and papers. Nobody did that. And in fact, laws were passed against him. As I said, there are 13 countries that have anti-Holocaust laws, not just to deny, to question the figure 6 million. If somebody says no, there were in fact 5.5 million, some countries would put you in jail. For what crime? for daring to question the figures of the Holocaust. Once again, I state unequivocally, I am not supporting David Irving in what he said. I am not, but what I am questioning, why is it that not a single organization, no major media outlet from the New York Times to the Washington Post, nothing stood up and said, hey look guys, it's just something he said. Allow him the freedom of speech. Why isn't he allowed to say what he wants to say? He's being put in jail in a foreign country as a British citizen being jailed in Austria simply because he wrote an academic book about Again, the Holocaust. We're not supporting somebody like that. Neither are we supporting racists. Neither are we supporting anybody of their ilk. But what we are pointing out is something called double standards. Why is it that when we criticize those who make fun of our Prophet ﷺ, we're labeled intolerant, we're labeled backward, we're labeled this and that, and yet all of these people, when they say things that are, in all honesty, less insulting to the people who follow this religion, the Prophet ﷺ, no matter how much we all, of course, are against the Holocaust, but it's not making fun of Musa ﷺ, it's not making fun of their Prophet, 
And no doubt for the Yahud, their Prophet and their God is more sacred to them than any historical event. Similarly for us, our Prophet, our God, our book is more sacred and holy for us than any historical incident. And so this person is put in jail and nobody supports him. Everybody is for the fact that he should be punished. Every single person. So the double standards are quite clear. And I think that if we want to get involved in this area, in this arena, we need to be very aware that every society has its zone, that they feel comfortable poking a few jokes here and there, and then there are self-imposed lines that respectful, respectable members of any society simply cannot cross. And if they do cross it, they have, to, they have to face the consequences, if not legally, at least socially. And I just want to point out before I move on, that 50 years ago or 100 years ago, it was possible to say things about African Americans that you can't say now. It was possible to say things about our theological cousins of the Yehud that you cannot say now. What happened? They worked, they strived. They made it such that those issues become what taboo. Did the Jews do? What did the Yehud do? They, they fought, they strove, they educated the people, and they made these issues culturally taboo. So we as Muslims need to do the same thing. It's not, we're not asking for laws to be passed, at least I am not, because I understand the, the, the freedom of speech as it works in this country, we're not going to get any laws passed. What we are asking is cultural sensitivity. Be that as the case is, the question arises, what do we do? in the light of such harsh First attacks. There is a general trend in the history of not just our ummah, of all ummahs, that prophets and righteous men are ridiculed in one way or another. And it is psychologically gratifying for those who reject the message <laughs> to reject it based upon rejecting the messenger rather than the message. When you cannot attack the message, you begin to attack the messenger. It is something that is intellectually easy, psychologically gratifying, and to be honest, intellectuals don't use this attack. You, you deal with the message, La ilaha illallah, Jannah, Tawheed, Akhirah, Naam, this is what you deal with. But to attack the messenger instead of the message is a tactic that has always been used by the riffraff, by the people, by the masses. It's nothing new. So realize this. Secondly, the general rule of the Qur'an, is that we respond to such vitriolic attacks with kindness and intelligence and piety. This is the general rule. We respond by showing we are the better of the two. We respond like Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ Argue with them in the best manner. And if you cannot respond with nobility, then my advice is do not respond, period. If you cannot respond with nobility and akhlaq, then do not respond. And that is exactly what Allah Azza wa Jal says, when the average Muslim is uh, offended, when the person comes and tries to ridicule him, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When the foolish come and they try to argue with them, they say, Salama, peace, I have better things to do with my time. If you cannot respond academically, intellectually, if you cannot respond with akhlaq and manners, don't respond. Just say, Salama. And console yourself with the fact that when you hear these things, your blood boils indeed. But it wasn't just your blood that was boiling. The Prophet do you not think he was affected? Do you not think he was affected by what people said? Allah said to, in, in the Quran to him, Surah Al-Hijr, verses 97 to 100. We know that your heart is constricted because of what they say. The Prophet ﷺ, he felt narrow, he felt a constriction in his heart. What was the response? فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ Praise your Lord and prostrate to Him. Get involved in the worship of Allah. وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ And worship Allah until death comes to you. You're not going to respond to every single riffraff. You're not going to respond to every barking dog. Let them bark. You have better things to worry about. This is what our Prophet ﷺ is told. So don't let it dishearten you to the level that you, pr you, you close your productivity. You do what you can, and you aim for higher goals. And the last and final point, if you do respond, do so with academic integrity. Don't change the religion, don't distort our own history, because not only is this impermissible and unethical, you're opening up a very, very dangerous door. If you cannot defend, except by distorting your own religion,
then in all honesty, you are opening up a more evil door than what those people said. If you cannot defend except by distorting or denying what is true, then you are not qualified to defend. And leave it to those who are many, many, many ways of defending his honor. And to be brutally honest, the best way to defend the honor of our Prophet wasallam is not through academic debates. It's not through fancy rhetoric. It's not through meeting people and discussing things with them, but rather through simple and sincere action, through humility, through humbleness, through sincerity, through good akhlaq. The best way to defend the honor of the Prophet ﷺ is to follow his sunnah and to show and to demonstrate to people that indeed our messenger was nothing except a rahmatan lil alameen wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen that is the best way to defend the honor of our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ.